So we discussed the concept of recycling when it comes to vectorized operations. Here's just one more example. Right. So this time what's happening is it's an it's a proper multiple. This has two elements. This has six elements. So R is going to do the job properly. Right. It's going to do one, two, one, two, one, two, and then do the multiplication and you get the results. I just wanted to show this example to say that this phenomenon of when it recycles the smaller vector uh, to make it up to the size of the larger vector, that's called recycling. Okay, and of course we've already seen an example where we could mix vectors and scalars. For example, we had weights times two, where weights was a vector and two is just a scalar. Here's just one more example. Okay, so this is an example that combines recycling and uh, combining of vectors and scalars. So for example, two times x will be, uh, you know, x will become 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2 to make it equal to the size. So 2 times x is going to multiply each of those uh, by 2 and then y is just a vector so it's going to add that to, to that result and then it's going to add 1 to every element. right? So you're mixing vectors and scalars in this part and in this part and you're also doing recycling because of this. Okay, So all of this uh, works perfectly fine. <coughs> now very often uh, you've seen in the last course also that uh, we do certain operations which involve the use of random numbers, especially when we do sampling and when we did partitioning and so on. Of course, we never directly used a random number generator, but we called certain functions like create uh, data partition, which internally used random numbers generators. Okay, and we already know that if you want, uh, you know, if I generate 10 random numbers or a thousand random numbers and you generate a certain you know thousand random numbers <coughs> and for whatever reason we want the random numbers that I generate and you generate to match you know maybe I wrote some code and you are verifying the code uh, so you obviously you should be able to replicate my results so in order for us to replicate the results uh, for random numbers both of us should set the seed of the random number to the same value it doesn't matter what the value is it can be a thousand it can be 999 it can be minus five it doesn't matter so, so long as we set the seed of the random number to the same starting value, then all the random numbers that you and I generate uh, will be in exactly the same sequence. Okay, so here I just set the seed just to illustrate that concept. And here I'm generating random uniform numbers or unif, right? So you know that there are many uniform, uh, there are many random number distributions, uh, probability distributions. So this one says, generate for me 10 uniform random numbers, 10 being the argument that is supplied. And a uniform random number is a random number between 0 and 1. And when we say it's a uniform distribution, that means suppose we generate, uh, you know, 100 of those or 500 of those, then you'll expect all of those numbers, if you uh, did a histogram, you expect them to be uniformly distributed between various ranges. So for example, uh, between 0 and 0.1, You'll have, a, you'll have a certain number between 0.1 and 0.2. You'll have a certain number between 0.2 and 0.3, etc. You would expect that if you generated sufficiently large number of random numbers, you'll expect that all of these numbers will be pretty close. Of course, it won't be exactly identical because, you know, they're random numbers after all. They're not going to, uh, you know, the each number is completely independent, theoretically, of what happened earlier, right? But you'll find that it gets kind of uniformly distributed. Okay, so that's a uniform random number. So if you did this, you would get uh, something like this, right? Each number is obviously between 0 and 1. And of course, with just 10 numbers, you won't, you don't expect to get very uniform distribution. But if you generated sufficiently large numbers, you would get a proper uniform distribution. Okay, in fact, we can even jump into our studio and try it out. Okay, so I'm going to do here, uh, I'm just opening a piece of code here. A file new file R script and here I'm going to just write the code I'm going to say let's say uh, W is random uniform and let's say I generate a thousand of those okay I'm not setting the seed because there's no need to replicate in this particular example so let it generate whatever it wants right uh, I do that and then I just generate a histogram of W Okay, now you would expect that the histogram bars are all of nearly the same size. Okay, so I'm going to execute the first line of code, execute the second line of code, and the histograms are pretty much 
uniform. Okay, so this uniform random number generator is not extremely accurate. As you can see, there are some which are, uh, you know, kind of near 100 and some which are near 80. So there is quite a bit of variation. But of course, I would think that if I change this to not 10,000, but to 100,000 and tried it, then uh, you would find that it's the approximation is much, much better. Okay, so you see that uh, it's pretty close here. Okay, so that's what we mean by a uniform random, uh, uniform random number. Okay. Uh, similarly, you can generate random numbers from other distributions. So here you're generating a random number from the normal probability distribution. Again, I'm generating just 10 numbers. Okay. Now, if you don't form uh, supply any additional arguments, it will generate random normal num uh, numbers from the random normal distribution with a mean 0 and standard deviation 1. Okay. So you'll see that if you do this, then you get, of course, it's a normal distribution. Uh, the mean is 0. So the values are going to be distributed equally on uh, either side of 0. So you will have negative and you'll have positive values, okay? And you'll also have numbers which are, uh, you know, uh, my less than uh, minus 1 and greater than plus 1. You might get uh, that. That's perfectly possible because the standard deviation is 1. And therefore, you could have numbers which are, you know, 2 standard deviations, 3 standard deviations, 4 standard deviation away, right? So it is possible, theoretically, that you can get even uh, 1,000 generated, right? That's because you just got a number which was 1,000 standard deviations away. It's possible. So that could happen. So once again, we could try the uh, normal distribution, R norm in R and see how good that is. Okay. So I'm going to again just say uh, instead of W R uniform, I'm going to try W or, you know, X R norm, random normal, and I'm going to generate 100,000. Okay. And then we'll plot the histogram. This time we would expect to see a bell-shaped kind of histogram. Of course, it's a histogram, it's not a continuous thing, so it cannot be bell-shaped, but it will resemble a bell-shaped distribution fairly symmetrically. Okay, so that's what we expect and uh, it looks like it, the numbers that it generated were actually from uh, a random uh, normal distribution. Okay, so that's, that's how random numbers work. And of course, like I've already said, we are not going to directly use random numbers, uh, directly generate random numbers. Most of the time, we'll generate random numbers. Uh, we'll call certain functions, and those functions will, in turn, be using generated random numbers. But once again, you know, you're trying to deepen your understanding of R, so you should have an idea of what's going on when you see random numbers. Okay, so we've seen vectors. We can sort vectors, right? So for example, if you do sort x, it's going to sort it in ascending order. If you want descending order, you can say decreasing equals true or uh, DECR equals T. Or you could say DECR equals true or decreasing equals T. All of that is fine. Right. So, uh, but notice an important point here. Uh, suppose I've got these and let's say uh, uh, I'm just going to generate, uh, uh, just create a vector. Okay, so I just created a vector. So if I run this piece of code, that vector would get created, right? Now, if I say sort x, and if I run the piece of code, then what you're going to see is a result, and of course, clearly, this is sorted in ascending order, as we expect, right? But if you look at the value of x, it's still going to be the original vector, right? Because when we said sort x, we didn't actually, in change the value that is contained in the variable x itself. What R did was it took those values, it sorted the values and gave us back a new vector. And we didn't store the new vector anywhere and therefore it simply printed it on the screen. Okay, that's what happened. But we did not change x. We only got what would be the results if the values were sorted, right? Now suppose for whatever reason we wanted to change x into its sorted version then obviously we would have to assign that result back to x, right? So we would have to not just say sort x, we would instead have to say sort it and assign the result back into x, right? So this time I'm going to run the code again. So this time I'm sorting it 
but I'm putting the result back into X. So now when I look at X, I will see that it's its star sorted version. Okay, this is a very important and subtle distinction between just doing an operation on a vector when you get back the result, but the underlying object is not changed. But if you do want to change the underlying object, then you have to assign the result back. Until now, we've been creating data frames by reading from files, right? So we did read.csv, and then we would get a data frame. But you can also programmatically create data frames, and that's what I'm showing you here. So for example, I'm creating uh, a vector of names, four people's names, and a vector of, of ages of those three pe four people, and then their status of buyer or non-buyer. So for example, the first person was a buyer, the second person was a non-buyer of some product, whatever it is, right? So now we have three vectors. What I want to do is to put these three vectors together into a data frame. That's easily done by using the function data.frame. Okay, so I'm saying data.frame and the name, age, status. Okay, and of course I'm putting the result into this variable called df. And df is now the data frame that contains all of these three columns. Okay, so if you print out df, you'll see that it looks like this. Okay, so the name became the first column, age became the second column, and status became the third column. So you can create data frames by using this approach. Okay, so let's just quickly uh, review some of the things that we have done. Uh, so what I would suggest is that uh, you take a look at the question, uh, you know, pause the video, try to answer the question, and then, you know, continue the video and compare your answers with what I have. Okay, so create a vector called VEC with the elements 10, 20, 50, and 100. Okay, so like I suggested, just pause the video, write the R code you need, uh, you would need in order to do this, and then continue the video and check your answer. It's a very good idea to, uh, you know, rather than just continuously keep listening to a lecture, it's a very good idea to test your understanding by solving some problems, uh, because that'll sort of force you to think back on what you learned, you know, uh, go back, review the concepts and so on and so forth and then do something and, and learning actually takes place when you do that rather than just you know passively listening that's not really going to help it's not time well spent right so this way it, it might appear that listening to the lecture is taking a little longer uh, but believe me uh, it's much it's time well spent okay so the answer would obviously be c 10 20 50 100 that's a vector and then we are putting the result into the variable called vec that's because that's what we've been asked to do, right? We didn't just say create a vector with these elements, in which case we could have simply said C 10, 20, 50, 100. But we were asked to create a vector called VEC, which is why I'm assigning the result back in, uh, into a variable called VEC. Okay, so create a vector names with your first name and last name as its elements. So this is, of course, going to be a vector of strings and I'm assuming you're a very smart person. So names is uh, C. Albert Einstein. Given a vector x, find the number of elements in the vector. And of course, there's a hint here that says use the length function. Okay, this is something we have not actually covered in the lectures, but with this hint, you ought to be able to easily do the job. Okay, so here I am, you can just do length of x. And that's it, because length is the function. We are already told that. And you want to find the length of this vector x. So just say length of x. Of course, I'm assuming that prior to this, the vector already exists. We've created it in some way. So given a vector y with only non-zero elements, create a new vector y inverse, or I'm just calling it y i n v. That's just the name of the vector that contains the reciprocals of the corresponding elements of y. Okay, so in other words, what we want is you're given a vector y with non-zero elements. We want to create another vector with reciprocals of those non-zero elements, right? So for example, the vector y might be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, just an example. Now, again, because we want to perform the operation on every element of the vector, uh, the easiest thing to do is to use vectorized operations. So I can just say y dot in, of course, I just called it y dot in instead of y in as it was required. Uh, now the dot 
as a uh, in a in a variable name has no particular significance in R, right? So you can use dots in variable names just to make your variable names uh, convenient and easy to read. So I'm just saying y dot n is assigned one divided by y. Again, this is a vector operation. One is a scalar, y is a vector. So what R is going to do is to replicate one as many number of times as required. In this case, five times, and then divide uh, each element correspondingly, just like we did earlier. Right, so this is just an example of a vectorized operation. Okay, so in this case, this is what you expect. 1 divided by 1 is 1. 1 divided by 2 is 0 0.5, 0 0.33, 0 0.25, 0 0.2. So that's what you got. Okay, so we are saying given a vector y with only non-zero elements, replace each of its elements by its square root. Right, so we... We are saying you want to replace the values of y with uh, the square root of each of the elements. We are not just saying find the square root of each of the elements of y. Okay, we want to replace it, which means that uh, we have to assign the result back. Right, so y is c1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Then I can say y is y raised to the power, this is the exponentiation operator, raised to the power 0 0.5 or you can use the square root function, y equals square root of y. So we are computing the value and putting the result back into y. Notice that I am using the uh, assignment operator equal to and the other assignment operator interchangeably. Uh, for what we are going to do in this course, it doesn't matter. The two can be completely interchangeably used. Okay, here I am just, uh, you know, you could read this and see, given two vectors a and b, create a new vector res with the first element obtained by subtracting the first element of a from the first element of b, second second element of a, of a from b, and so on. Right. So we are basically subtracting every element of a, uh, uh, you know, b from every element of a. So once again, it's just a vector operation. A is this, b is this, and what we want is b minus a. We are computing b minus a and putting the result into this variable called res. Given a numeric vector vec, find the sum of its elements. I shouldn't have the comma there, but it's there. Uh, so find the sum of its elements. Okay. Now you might be, you might have guessed, uh, or you might recall from the previous course that the f there is a function called sum that computes the sum of a vector. So here is a vector vec c one two three. Just for example, you can just do sum vec. Okay. Now, we were not asked to assign the result to any variable, so I did not do any assignment. I just said sum of vec, and you will get 6. Okay. Uh, given, given a numeric vector, find the sum of its first 10 elements. Once again, there is an offending comma here. Please ignore it. Given a numeric vector, find the sum of its first 10 elements. In other words, I may have a vector with 100 elements, but I just want to find the sum of its first 10 elements. Okay. So what you need to do, obviously in this case is first create the vector with only the first 10 elements and then use the sum function on that vector okay but you don't have to do it in two steps you can do it in just a single step so vec is 1 to 100 so i created a vector with the values 1 to 100 in it so the first element is 1 the second element is 2 and the 100th element is 100 just for convenience i could have put anything i could have for example said uh, for random uniform 100 to get 100 random uniform numbers, it doesn't matter. Just a vector with 100 elements. Now, how do I get the first 10 elements of this? Okay. If you recall from the last course, you can use the subscripting to do that. So, for example, if you say vec and within brackets, you give 1 to 10, right? So, and this is not a data frame, it's just a vector. So, you know, don't need to specify the comma and then other part of it. So, now what this vec 1 to 10 is nothing but a new vector with only the first 10 elements of vec. Okay, I can then apply the sum function on that new vector. Okay, so it's perfectly possible. So to the sum function, uh, in the previous slide, we just said sum of vec. It doesn't mean that you're allowed to give only a single variable here. You can give any expression here whose result is a vector. And that will work just as, just as well, and that's what we have done here. Okay, so we wrote an expression here whose result is also a vector. And then we applied the sum function on that and we got the answer, 55. Okay, 
Uh, here we are just exploring how to create a data frame. Create two vectors, one with the names of people, another with the heights, and then combine these into a data frame called students. Okay, so you've got the uh, names, you've got the heights, and of course you can say data dot frame, name, height, name, age. Okay, I said heights, but I've done age here, but you get the idea. 